so welcome everyone to the sixth and the final uh, lecture of the cct uh, of this semester uh, titled uh, beyond metropolis uh, before i introduce ajay sonar um, i'll quickly uh, you know kind of give a brief brief background of what the series is about um, and i'll introduce ajay and then ask him to present his lecture so the intention of the uh, lecture series is to look at urban conditions beyond metropolises in india um whereas let's say urban conditions uh, beyond metropolises in india have been widely viewed as inward looking on claves of local economy culture and politics urban life is considered to unfold here in the shadow of the globally connected and much sought after world class metro cities through illegible property rights social interactions and meshed in primordial communal passions the architecture of an urban form that lends towards social segregation and so on as emerging context fuel the ex explosion of uh, such urban conditions india's urban turn has decisively poised towards the proliferation of small cities during the last decade this series of c conversations invites artists architects filmmakers and urbanists to offer provocations on how we could read read into and engage with the multiple emerging presence and futures of urban life urban form and architecture beyond the metropolis with this i'll just briefly introduce uh, ajay sonar and a for architecture his studio um a for architecture was founded by ajay sonar and monali patel in the year 2011 in nasik so that fits nicely in the timeline that we are trying to map in this series ajay sonar was born in a family uh, working in the construction industry over the last three generations he graduated from the college of architecture nasik after which he worked in mumbai for a period of 2 years before setting up his own practice he is an alumni of glen market masterclass 2014 organized by australian architecture foundation in sydney um, he has also been a visiting faculty in various colleges of nasik and mumbai for the last 10 years monali patil graduated from architecture of, uh, college of architecture nasik after which she worked for 2 years in in a landscape firm in nasik she did a specialization in sustainable management of natural resources and natural conservation from ecological society of pune before setting up her practice she is actively involved in research of on indigenous species and ancient medicinal plants of india um i won't go into the outline of the lecture but broadly speaking um, i think ajay's lecture will try to locate the 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 shifts that are taking place in nasik today and how as a studio as an as a, as a practice they're trying to respond uh, to the shifting urbanization and emerging urbanization of nasik today uh, with that i invite ajay uh, to start his presentation and i'll turn off my video you myself thanks thanks shriyank and uh, i would really like to thank uh, c uh, for inviting me to do this uh, because this year has been really special uh, as we have completed 10 years and we are already in process of writing about the learnings of these 10 years and exactly at this moment uh, this invitation uh, for the talk comes in which gave us an uh, interesting opportunity to look back uh, at our practice uh, through this lens uh, of second cities and uh, how we have been participating and contributing uh, in this very interesting shift which nasik is going through from last 20 years so uh, uh, i'm really thankful for this opportunity so i'll start with my talk uh, the presentation is called basically notes on 10 years of practice because we are still formulating and understanding what we have done in last 10 years uh the experiments the failures uh, the learnings all of that so uh, before we uh, come to the works of the studio the presentation is primarily going to talk about uh, nasik uh, and where do we come from and specifically for this presentation what we've done is that we focused uh, on projects uh, in nasik city instead of adding up other set of projects so uh, going in line with the uh, concept of, of the series we've just limited uh, to projects done in nasik some five projects done in last 10 years at different points of time and different typologies uh, dealt as so that's where nasik is uh, so uh, on the physical map of india if you see that we are almost uh, at the tip of uh, the sayadri mountain ranges uh, which 
sort of uh, has a great uh, ecological setting around Nasik and this Sayadri mountain ranges are already one of the biggest hotspot uh, in terms of ecology. And now coming um, in detail, so this is uh, the Nasik city limits and uh, how, so this map specifically shows that how it is surrounded with these uh, mountain ranges all around uh, with the Brahmagiri mountains from where the Godavari river starts uh, to the Anjaneri mountains and a few other mountain ranges part of the Sayadri mountain ranges and how these mountain ranges have created these catchments uh, within those uh, which are some set of dams around. So Nasik uh, because of such uh, physical conditions, Nasik has got uh, the highest density of dams uh, in India, I think, which is around 25 to 30 major dams and backwaters uh, all around Nasik, which creates a very unique uh, sort of ecological condition. So anywhere you go, uh, you drive 10 to 15 minutes out of the city and you are in these sort of uh, uh, very idyllic sort of settings. Uh, so these are some of the dams, which are the Vaitarna Dam, which is one of the major backwaters uh, in Nasik, the Vati Dam, uh, the Gangapur Dam, which is the most celebrated in terms of the recent uh, hospitality developments. Uh, going ahead, uh, so these are some of the visuals from uh, the surrounding landscape. I think uh, this really becomes very important for us. Uh, to refer while talking about the practice, uh, because we are surrounding with things like this, this has become part of our day-to-day -day life in Nasik. So these are the engineering mountains, and you can just see uh, the gigantic presence of these mountains. And then uh, this is uh, one of the backwaters, which is one of the first dams on the Godavari River called the Beze Dam. Uh, so this is one of our sites for a project. Uh, so. And then these mountains and valleys together have created these uh, very dynamic sort of landscapes. Uh, so this is the Vaitarna Dam uh, uh, during a rainy season. And uh, these kind of changing landscapes and this sort of uh, uh, wetlands and uh, all, of, all of these together create a very fertile ground for uh, um, vegetables and fruit. Uh, farming and uh, grapes, uh, which is uh, which is what has brought Nasik on the global map as a wine capital of India. So uh, there are these climatic conditions which really allow us to do that. Uh, so these, uh, so this is one of the uh, initial uh, caves done in the first century BC, and uh, some of the human interventions done in that uh, era. And these, all of these things continuously uh, kind of become a very common sort of references while working on each and everything what we are doing uh, in the practice, uh, through the research, or even teaching uh, in different schools. Uh, this is uh, the Godavari River. And this spot particularly is the Ramkund where uh, the Kumbh Mela happens. Uh, so this particular spot uh, on the day of Kumbh Mela almost attracts 50 lakh to 1 crore people uh, at a time, which is one of the largest gatherings. Uh, this is the same space uh, during the Kumbh Mela uh, in 2015. And you can see that uh, how the same um, sort of setting uh, accommodates such huge numbers. So uh, we've, we've done a detailed research uh, on all of these things uh, as part of the smart city program. And uh, we realized that how cities are capable of sort of stretching uh, themselves like physically, emotionally to accommodate uh, all of these things, which has been a very interesting part of our history and the culture. Uh, these are some of the old buildings uh, from the uh, older part of Nasik. And if you see very interestingly, if you see that 
the river, the buildings next to the river are having this uh, stone plinth which becomes a very important marker for uh, the flood levels uh, around the river and then everything about that is done in brick and the topmost levels are then done in wood or something more lighter but then this has uh, these uh, conditions have somehow created a very interesting vocabulary where nasik originally uh, was all with such sort of a material palette where there used to be this high plains with brick structures and uh, uh, wooden brick structures and where the topmost level would become these wooden pavilions so at one point of time the entire city was like this nasik uh, is uh, one of the unique situations where both the sides of the river were developed simultaneously which is very different from some of the other historical cities like for example banaras uh, which is primarily only developed on uh, one side of the river uh, so these are some of the uh, buildings on the other side of the river uh, which you can see these are the historical buildings and then the new ones coming up and negotiating with all of these this is uh, one of the buildings done by gadge maharaj this is an uh, ashram so this was uh, conceived uh, designed and uh, executed by gadge maharaj himself uh, on the banks of the river uh, on one of the hillocks and the way he has responded uh, to uh, uh, the entire uh, site conditions uh, the vocabulary of the existing architecture of nasik is just fantastic like the way he's done all the plains and all these uh, uh, primarily all the plains and all the levels were created in stone above which is built in stone and then brick and the topmost levels are incrementally added over these plains uh, with wood and mangalore tiles so this is part of the dharmashala so this uh, entire development has a school for uh, underprivileged kids uh, it has uh, dharmashala it has medical facilities uh, and few uh, social uh, spaces this is one of the images uh, clicked recently during uh, holi uh, from the old cities of old part of nasik uh, and then these are uh, the new development so this is on the other side of the river which is uh, so there are two primary uh, primary roads which is gangapur road and college road uh, which are uh, newer developments done in last 20 25 years because of some of the educational institutions we were which were established in this portions slowly attracted a lot of commercial and residential development and this is where nasik is expanding towards so uh, these are the kind of buildings which are coming up in last 10 15 years so this is college road which is one of the commercial uh, streets and that's big bazaar which had come some 20 years back in nasik so primarily nasik is full of these mid rise uh, commercial and residential developments which are dotted uh, without any clear segregation so college road also has got a lot of residential developments which are then later on ripped off uh, in the rest recent uh, 10 years and then there are commercial developments coming up in these places that's uh, one of the image from the sula fest which has now almost become like a, um, equivalent to kumbh mela for people in nasik where uh, so before sula fest uh, the only time when every residential facility uh, or every hotel every lodge in nasik used to be booked was only at the time of kumbh mela but sula fest has become this new event where each and every uh, facility is completely booked in nasik during these three days of festival which happens every year uh, by sula and this is suddenly um, so this recent uh, sort of shift uh, which is happening Uh, right from nasik uh, being an industrial town to now coming towards hospitality and these new set of typologies has uh, created all of this 
so yeah eco architecture uh, eco architecture was established by me and monali in 2011 and uh, the name eco architecture is more like a a uh, slogan to us uh, to sort of remind us every morning that we are here to sort of do architecture and kind of re questioning uh, this idea of uh, architecture and practicing architecture uh, on an everyday basis uh, this is one of the collages which we had uh, recently made uh, so what we are trying to say here is that uh, in last 20 30 years uh, nasik from a pilgrim city was primarily uh, moving towards an industrial town where uh, people like the mahindras and bosch uh, became the major uh, setups so mahindras uh, so there's a very interesting story where uh, mahindras used to come uh, to nasik uh, to play golf uh, at one of the very famous uh, golf grounds uh, which was done in the british era and uh, then as they used to come to nasik uh, so uh, one of the architects who used to uh, work for them in mumbai had recommended uh, that why don't they start a plant here and then finally mahindra was established in nasik and that uh, so half of the industries in the nasik mrdc are primarily vendors to mahindra and then mahindra bosch and myco are some of the major players because of which uh the uh, entire midc is established so this was um, in the last 30 years this is how nasik was growing uh, from the pilgrim city to uh, uh, industrial town and then uh, with the recent uh, sort of shift uh, and nasik has now become more of a uh, weekend uh, town and a tourist place and a lot of hospitality development is happening uh, in and around nasik and suddenly this outskirts of nasik have uh, started coming up with a lot of dotted development uh, which was initially only focused towards these urban centers has now uh, started going more towards the periphery uh, so going ahead uh, we thought that uh, we could start uh, the set of projects from the studio itself uh, to also understand uh, rest of the methods uh, practiced within the studio so this is a broader context uh, map uh, to explain where the studio exists and uh, we are part of a residential like a suburban residential colony very close to the godavari river uh, and we are on the older side of the town which is called panchoti um, and so we are very much uh, in the city but what happens is uh, we've got this huge urban void uh, which is the uh, reserve forest of the maharashtra engineering research institute and we just abutting that forest which suddenly creates a very unique uh, condition uh, for us so what you see is uh, uh, a huge forest with uh, all native vegetation and uh, it attracts a lot of uh, birds um, and it has got a lot of peacocks and all sorts of birds uh, the stream what you see is uh, waghadi which is which which is which, uh, one of the smaller streams which finally goes and meets uh, godavari uh, after 2 kilometers from here so we are like the last plot uh, on this colony so uh, the building is basically a g plus 4 building where uh, i stay uh, also so i stay on the top floor um, and ground floor is what we had already kept so this is a building which was done by my father many years back in 2010 11 exactly at the time when i had started practicing and um, so we stay here from 2013 and uh, in 2011 i had already started doing the office and while doing it i uh, somehow realized that uh, i am not clear about uh, what we are doing uh, as a practice and uh, i think i should stop so what i did was that the work was already done halfway and i had just stopped it at that point and uh, continued working in one, my old house uh, because we were primarily working in pune we didn't had a lot of projects in nasik so there were no visitors as such and we did not have any pressure 
of having a present evil office, which just became a great uh, thing at that moment because uh, we didn't get very conscious about these things. And then what we did was that we took a five-year break uh, and finally only started the office in 2016 uh, when we had a lot of clarity in terms of what do we want to do, what kind of uh, partial explorations we are interested in, what kind of material explorations we were doing, uh, how we would want to organize uh, the office and what is the kind of culture we wanted in the office. So I think that... Uh, became a very important thing. And as I said that as I was already staying uh, in the same building, I used to come quite often and look at the space and then go to the office. So while doing this, I had somehow realized a very interesting quality uh, of the space, which is which can be called as, as found space. So the space, the way it was built already had a certain architectural quality for itself. So what it had was this one bay uh, from the existing built form, the marginal space with a high wall to protect uh, from uh, the uh, neighboring forest and uh, some other informal uh, settlements around. So to secure ourselves, we had already made a wall. And then this already had a certain architectural quality uh, to itself. And then uh, the entire intention was to somehow understand and respond to this architectural quality instead of engaging into uh, interior decoration as an exercise. Because otherwise, if you imagine uh, doing an office in an apartment, you start getting more into these elements. But instead, we thought that if we could create this singular architectural space. So this is just a, a floor plan uh, to understand that how the office is uh, broken up into different activities. So this is the covered footprint and this is the marginal spaces. So of course, we'll talk about it in more detail. This is just to get familiar to how it is done. So we have uh, this as a studio, this as an entry foyer, and then this as a node, which takes you to different parts of the office. This is a closed room discussion space, and this is the open studio. So there is only two kinds of spaces. So, this is how it uh, looks from outside where the existing building already had this brown and white as a palette. And we very subtly wanted to continue that uh, wall uh, so that uh, it does not look like a commercial establishment. Uh, so what we did was we continued with this wall and created a separate entry instead of entering from the apartment, we created this separate entry, which sort of makes it feel more like a bungalow. And then this is how you align yourself in the entry. And this is the first uh, space, which is uh, the first courtyard uh, in a way, uh, referring to the idea of uh, 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 a courtyard in a dwelling. And then purposely we kept the floor as basalt uh, and everything else is sort of rendered in a single material of IPS. And uh, so we were referring to the idea of looking at the as found condition. We were almost referring to the idea of K uh, as an homogeneous space. And then we were looking for material which is capable of uh, creating this very seamlessly. And after exploring or thinking of a lot of different options. I thought that IPS is this one material which can go on the floor, walls and ceiling very uh, seamlessly and comes very closer to the idea of these rocket caves. And as I was very well engaged in this idea of space making, as I used to stay on the upper level, I used to always come and spend a good amount of time in this space. What we had done was we decided that we would render this entire space, finish it in IPS, and then decide about rest of the elements, which are sort of movable uh, furniture and doors and windows could come up later. So only after this was uh, done, uh, we uh, started thinking of the door windows and few other elements in detail absolutely uh, later. I'll just take you guys through the 
spaces. So this is the next uh, sort of space, which is the uh, waiting space. So the first courtyard is also like a courtyard come a waiting space, but what happens that it's not, uh, as it is open to sky in, in case of rainy season, it is wet. So we've created another space, which acts like a node, which is this, and from where most of the activities uh, open up. And this is that corridor, which brings you from the first courtyard to the second uh, uh, court, which is a covered sort of courtyard with the skyline. So, so the space actually is a rectangular lot uh, or a piece of land. But then the idea was to create this uh, sense of journey and this sense of compression and release. Uh, also exploring different volumes within the given uh, parameters. So the highest height, what we had was nine feet. But then we introduced these at seven feet and opportunities which uh, none of the clients gave us were primarily experimented in this office because uh, we tried to convince certain clients while doing houses before but they were not convinced so we thought that it would be nice to explore certain things in our office uh, and then take it ahead so oh, this is the node looking towards the entry so all of these shutters are primarily uh, folding and openable. Uh, otherwise, these shutters are closed and the water body is uh, the part of the closed discussion room. Uh, and whenever we have uh, larger public gatherings or over weekends, we just open up these uh, spaces. So this is the studio, which has half of it uh, open to sky with uh, glass over it towards the north. The building is on the south. So it very well uh, shades and protects this uh, marginal space uh, with a 15 meter uh, building on the right hand side. Half of it is covered where the workstations are. And this kind of becomes a spillover space for eating, making larger models, discussions, and a lot of other things. And then there's this back put at one of the corners, which just makes the space very efficient. And instead of having very formal divisions of Pantry and model making and drafting. We've just created one large space which has got these niches to do all of these things. So the pantry just becomes one of the niches. And this just gave us a larger space to work. This is the closed room uh, discussion space uh, where I'm right now sitting. So uh, this again closes and opens as per requirement and uh, otherwise becomes one large space. So this is a picture which shows that. How the courtyard, which is basically the courtyard of the entry foyer, uh, also extends in this space. And this space kind of becomes a pivotal uh, space uh, in the whole office. And then to create this idea of depth and a certain scale, uh, all these three columns which we had, uh, which were 230 by 600, were all made as square columns of 600 by 600. And we had added lofts at this lintel level, which created a very interesting sense of scale, almost closer to this huge monolithic uh, basalt columns, which you see in the caves. And then that gave us these lofts to uh, store a lot of models. So this is uh, one of the GIFs which very well explains different scenarios. So this is the regular working day uh, scenario. And then how it is used for public presentations. And then how it is used over a weekend. Uh, say weekends we have this bottle of lunch after which uh, we open up the entire space for playing games where the model making table becomes a TT table. The carom board goes somewhere else or we watch a movie. We invite someone to speak. So. Uh, the idea was that we had a lot of uh, things in our list of program, but the uh, given space was very less. We just thought that how we can uh, multiply space by using these uh, foldable devices and uh, also create this absolutely non-hierarchical sort of uh, setup where there's, where there's no sequence, there's no hierarchy, and which just creates a very casual, uh, open-ended workspace. This is one of the uh, GIFs again uh, to explain how the entire space transformed. 
So there's a projector put at the opposite end, and then someone standing at the entry with a, with a cup of coffee can also be part of the presentations in case of public presentation. So we were very clear that uh, we did not want it the office as a standalone workspace, but also something which could be lent for uh, larger public forums and discussions related to uh, architecture, the profession and the city uh, at large. And that is the reason we uh, invite uh, different artists, architects, uh, students to present their work and thoughts uh, and for a lot of Q&A uh, after these sessions. So in a, in a second tier city where you have less opportunities uh, coming up naturally through, so uh, as we do not have great flight connections, there is uh, rarely a chance that you have uh, celebrity architects coming in the city. So these are methods which we have as a larger group of architects also, we found uh, that these methods really help us to learn uh, things at our own pace. And then that's the office occupied at uh, other times. Uh, so the next project is another uh, development uh, of a wellness retreat, which uh, is done close to Trambakeshwar, very close to Trambakeshwar. And uh, as I said, that Nasik is now coming up with a lot of different hospitality setups uh, around Nasik. So this is uh, the image of the village, which is called the Beze village, uh, very close to the Gautami Godavari Dam, the, the, the dam which I had shown in the initial images. Uh, and then as if you see uh, the image, uh, we did not have, uh, so the project is in middle of these farmlands, uh, 500 meters from the backwaters. So you do not see the backwaters, you do not see anything. What you have is these distant mountains uh, and you're part of this valley. So they were not uh, very immediate, uh, strong contextual aspects which you could look at physically. So we just thought that uh, one of the methods of engaging in a project like this was to also understand uh, the craft and uh, building methods in these villages. Then this uh, village became a very important reference for us to understand the uh, craft practices. Uh, and then we took that ahead in the project. So this is the context map where uh, the project is here, which is a seven acre development. And the village I was showing is this. And this is, one of the dams, which is 500 meters from the site. And you can see that we are surrounded with these mountains all over. So this is the Trambak Highway from where you have uh, Trambakeshwar uh, just five kilometers from here. And you just go in four kilometers to reach to the project. So what we also do as a practice uh, consistently uh, is that to also reinterpret and look at uh, typologies and uh, understand that uh, how we can go ahead uh, from the very general or generic understanding of these types and create these uh, kind of a certain level of blur or a certain level of mix of these uh, typologies or how we can sort of reinvent or rethink uh, these spaces. So what we were doing as this was a wellness resort, we just thought that let's look at the idea of resort and what does a resort actually mean. So uh, a, a literal dictionary meaning if you look at the Oxford dictionary, it says that a place that is frequented for holidays, or recreation or for a particular purpose. But then if you go in depth and try and understand the uh, term uh, resort, or the origin of the word, so it comes from the French word, which is called disappear, which actually means to come out again or to re-emerge. And then this idea sort of struck us and uh, we thought that uh, it could be uh, very interesting to work around this. And then 
we started thinking that what are the ways to sort of re-emerge. So we found that to isolate, uh, to engage, or this idea of surprise uh, really uh, sort of help us to emerge. Simultaneously, while understanding this, uh, we were also trying to understand the history of Ayurveda and naturopathy in India, because uh, it is said that Ayurveda has a history of 4,000, 5,000 years in India. And uh, this center is primarily based on Ayurveda and naturopathy. So what we thought is that, okay, if Ayurveda has got this history, so let's try and understand, uh, try and understand what were the buildings and which were these building types in these uh, in which these things were practiced. So where Ayurveda was exactly practiced. So uh, we got to know. So starting from uh, the Indus Valley civilization, if you look at the Great Bath and if you look at some of the other, uh, some of the other uh, buildings. So we got to know that the temple complexes, uh, the dharmashalas, the sarais were places where uh, these things were practiced, uh, where uh, say um, someone who's traveling from point A to point B would stop at these temple complexes and dharmashalas and uh, uh, would take a break, pause, engage in a lot of these spiritual uh, and uh, other physical activities and would also get treated and would share his or her experience. So this is how uh, things went. And then after uh, understanding all of this, uh, we thought that it would be nice if we get away from the idea of a typical resort and we start sort of finding ways of creating um, a very strong response to these understandings which we had come up with. So this is uh, the site plan which shows, uh, so I'll just broadly explain, this is the reception and the drop-off. This is the staff facilities where all the uh, resident staffs uh, stay. Uh, this is the main building, which we call the amenity building. And then these are individual cottages. This is another uh, development, which is in phase two. But then this all is done. So what generally happens in a resort is that if you typically see uh, a smaller pitched roof becomes a room and a larger pitched roof becomes a restaurant, another larger pitched roof becomes a yoga space or a spa. So we just thought that uh, it is uh, architecturally too uh, simplistic. So we thought that can we understand these each of these activities in depth and come up with right uh, typological references for these. And if we could reinvent or redefine those typological references to come up with the right uh, spatial setting for all of these activities. So this main building primarily has five activities. One is the restaurant uh, and a, a reading space from an amphitheater. Second is a swimming pool with changing spaces. Third is the yoga and meditation hall. Fourth is uh, the massage rooms. And fifth is naturopathy uh, center with different uh, naturopathy treatments. So these were the typological references which we uh, referred uh, from the immediate region of Trambakeshwar. So Trambakeshwar has got these vadas which are uh, the houses uh, of merchants. Uh, then there are these um, smaller courtyard houses. Uh, then, as I showed, uh, the Pandavleni, which is very close from here, uh, the Buddhist Chaityas uh, uh, in the region, which are used as these meditation spaces. Uh, then the Kund. So the uh, Kund of Trambakeshwar is another spot for Kumbh Mela. Uh, where the Shaivites basically take a dip in this and the Vaishnavs basically use the Godavi uh, river, the Ram Kund, which I showed in the earlier images. So this is the Kushavar Kund. Uh, uh, the Trambak has got this Kushavar Kund. And then the ideas of ghats, uh, which are steps which lend you uh, these spaces for different uh, kind of interactive social activities. So. Taking all this ahead, uh, we started developing these individual spaces as five different diagrams 
for five different activities, which were developed in isolation till a certain stage. And after a point, we sort of merged it into a single building. And this created certain in-between spaces, which were beyond uh, our uh, imagination or something which we had not thought very clearly when we were doing these buildings individually. And then this is how uh, the uh, spaces have resulted from this. So this is the naturopathy, this is the uh, Ayurvedic massage rooms, this is the yoga dome, uh, that's the swimming pool, which is more like a pool done entirely in basal. And this is the restaurant and the amphitheater, which is based on the idea of guards. So these are, so what we did was that entire project uh, was based on this idea of native, like local material and local labor uh, from the region. So the basalt uh, used here comes from two of the quarries, which is all hand quarried uh, by uh, this specific community of people called the Wadari community uh, coming from the uh, Maharashtra Karnataka border. Uh, who are experts uh, of handling stone. So these people would hand quarry the stone, get it to the site, fit it, and everything is done by them, uh, right from quarrying it to fitting it at the site. And then we had also engaged with um, a lot of local carpenters and these uh, master carpenters who had uh, dealt with wood as a structural uh, material at some point of time in their life. Uh, so this is one of the carpenters uh, who came up with this fantastic idea of uh, using hardu uh, as an alternative wood because teak was getting too expensive. And uh, so when we started interacting with these crafts people, we realized that uh, teak was historically only used by the rich or the merchants or people who could afford it because it has been always kind of uh, an expensive thing. But otherwise, uh, a lot of people in the surrounding Adivasi villages around Trambak used to use hardu, uh, babul, and few other uh, woods, um, which are uh, very strong um, and very good for construction. So, we used hardu, which is one third of the cost of teak. And it comes from, again, the surrounding uh, forests. And finally, the pot tile. Uh, so there's a very interesting story when we thought of using pot tiles, which is a very common material in the surrounding villages, which are at least 100 or 150, 200 year old buildings. Uh, so we thought that we would use these pot tiles. But finally, when we went to look for someone who could uh, make this for us, we could not find anyone. And I had, at one point of time, I had just sent everyone from the studio in different directions in the city to find uh, these potters. And if anyone agrees to make these pot tiles for us, and we realized that most of them get things from Gujarat uh, and they just sell it here. And if they are making, they're just making few very basic sort of pots and selling it. And no one is engaging in this. Uh, building practice as such. And then we found uh, one person who's 65 year old. And then uh, someone from the studio came and told me that uh, he understands this, but he's not done it. Uh, so I went to meet him uh, with a book in my hand, a barefoot architecture. And uh, I had one sample of the pot tile with me. And I told him that if you make it successfully, you make 5,000 tiles for us. We want to do a mock up. If you make it successfully, we'll order you three lakh tiles. And he almost took it like a joke. Uh, and he said that, okay, I'll make these because I don't know if you are really going to use it because I haven't seen anyone coming uh, for these. And he said last time he had done this was when he was 15 years old and he used to work under his father. In last 50 years, no one had come uh, for these pot tiles. And so finally he made it and uh, we used uh, three lakh, more than three lakh tiles in this entire project uh, done by him. But what this did was that he was not capable of doing this alone with his small setup. So what he did, he uh, engaged with and he invited or asked all of his relatives in the surrounding regions of Nasik uh, to come and join him. And all of them were producing these pot tiles uh, simultaneously for a period of six months uh, 
before the rains start and then they supplied it so the structure is the load bearing stone walls till a height of 7 or 8 feet like 2 or 2.4 meter and then uh, a framework of hardu uh, which is the local wood which is then covered with uh, bamboo ply uh, which you get uh, uh, which is made by uh, the adivasi uh, adivasis from gadchiroli and all of these regions so that was ordered and we had covered it with this bamboo ply uh, which is a compressed uh, layer of bamboo mats and then uh, finally covered with pot tiles these are some of the uh, in between spaces so the idea was that the architectural portions were all very much in right angle responding to the material and the wood and all of that but what we did was the landscape areas or the surrounding courtyards were done as curves so that whenever you are outside you are in a very fluid sort of space and whenever you enter in uh, the built spaces those are these right angles so these are uh, the residential facilities which are so this these are some of the transitional spaces which we kind of call as threshold uh, spaces for these deep threshold before you open up so these kind of become very interesting transition spaces uh, from one space to another which almost stretches the idea of time uh, so this is the entry of uh, the main building from the main entrance you going towards the pool and this is what you see when you come up here so this is the amphitheater and if you see the entire project is primarily thought or built in these uh, layers of stone so what we do is that material is not just like a visual but also the idea of scale for us comes from the material so we realize that here uh, the hand quarried stone what we were getting the layers were going to be possible in between uh, 150 mm to 180 mm somehow uh, and you do not get a stone bigger than that so what we did was instead of mentioning specific dimensions which would force them to chisel the stone beyond a certain limit and waste the material we started defining most of the things based on layers and we told them that every th three layer could become a seating so then the amphitheater is actually not 450 mm precisely but then it is an in a range of 450 to 480 depending on the layer of stones and then they have to follow this logic of layers where there is one mock up wall made somewhere in the site and then that becomes a scale where uh, they do not have to follow the precise architectural dimensions and then this is the restaurant which sits on top of this amphitheater with an extended plinth the idea was to almost make it feel that as if it's some ruins which are occupied and then this is the extended uh, space of the pool where the pool is almost like the landscape with this water instead of a tank to just swim this is a place which extends like uh, a ghat at one point so people who do not want to swim can just sit in the water and relax uh, the entries uh, for the male and female changing rooms are at two end where you enter dry and then you come out Uh, wet in the pool, and the water almost goes in these spaces, and then you can enter in these and change and come out dry. So, it kind of uh, as a spatial sequence works very interesting. So, if you see this, what happens is that from the changing room you come slowly into the pool, and then you first get comfortable to the temperature of the water, and then you slowly get into the water, and you get comfortable once you are in the water till your waist height or whatever. and then you come from a private space to a public space this is the other side of the same transitional space which brings you to the yoga and meditation space which is this which is basically a dome um, over a stone wall with an oculus on the top and deep uh, sort of uh, if you can see these smaller opening these are deep uh, metal sections with mosquito mesh which almost work like nostrils for the space to breathe so we did not want a lot of openings uh, for people to get sort of distracted but then we had introduced these smaller punctures uh, which allow uh, the space to breathe 
Uh, these are some of the transitional spaces outside the Ayurveda space. Uh, this is another uh, transitional space, uh, uh, which becomes the waiting area for the male and female sections of the naturopathy. And if you see the idea of one material at a time or a single material or this idea of homogeneous spaces uh, is very clear here. And if you write any timeline, the material or the details is done in a way where you do not uh, realize that it is done uh, at this point of time. It's the same space where everything is sort of inbuilt. Uh, this is the uh, naturopathy center uh, with the uh, male sections above and the female sections below sharing a courtyard which is uh, with a reflection pool because 70 percent of naturopathy treatment 70 to 75 percent of naturopathy treatments are based on water they are hydrotherapies so we thought that uh, having a uh, water body in the belly of the building would be a nice idea uh, based on the idea of naturopathy which also becomes a reflection pool and a collection tank for all the rainwater, which from here takes it to the rainwater harvesting tank. And these are the residential clusters. So you go through these narrow sort of uh, streets and covered pathways. And then you have a shared courtyard with four units at four corners with their smaller verandas, which could be used for eating, sipping a coffee, interacting uh, for a couple. Uh, this is how the interiors of uh, the rooms are worked out with a private courtyard. As we were on a flat land, ensuring privacy was already a challenge. If it's a sloping land, then you can very well achieve that. But in a flat land, when people are moving at the same level, uh, this would have not had that kind of privacy. So what we did was we wrapped up the uh, residential development with a uh, stone wall at a certain distance, which does two things. First, it creates an immediate landscape outside the room. And secondly, it ensures that people are walking at a certain distance from the room. So you can very clearly see this uh, bamboo ply here uh, with air conditions and everything hidden here. So we did not want any plastic to sort of pop up in these spaces. Uh, the floor is all IPS. These are some of the outdoor landscape areas. So this is a drawing which very well sums up this entire process in the project where if you see the building, this very well explains that how uh, the stone comes from the surrounding mountains, the pot tiles come from the local Kumbhar who's made it with uh, us in this process. The wood uh, comes from two places. One is uh, the forest for the structure and all the smaller elements cannot be made in Hardu because Hardu do not have it does not have a kind of density which peak has. So the smaller pieces of furniture, doors and windows were all done with uh, teak wood, but all upcycled teak wood coming from the dilapidated and the demolished old buildings from uh, Nasik. So all of that was the older teak wood, which is at least 100 or 150 year old uh, wood coming from these older demolished buildings. And also the labor. So the labor came from the surrounding villages, which, uh, so these are farmers who work as seasonal laborers uh, at different times of the year. So whenever there's farming activity right from the rainy season till some time, they would go back to their uh, villages and work as farmers. And other time of the year, they work as uh, daily wages labor. So they were uh, working with us on the project. Of course, having specific skill sets already with them as part of their DNA, where uh, the stone masons have been doing uh, or working with stone from hundreds of years. Same with the Kumbhar and the uh, carpenters who were these sutar. So um, coming from the idea of this caste system based on your profession. Uh, this is so after these two sort of commercial establishment, our office and uh, uh, Viveda. Uh, this is another typology, which is uh, uh, these new sort of typologies coming up with uh, in Nasik as holiday homes in the outskirts of Nasik, uh, which has become a new sort of aspiration for people uh, in Nasik and from the surrounding uh, metro cities like Bombay and Pune, 
so there are people from Mumbai and Pune coming and making these houses, and also from Gujarat. Gujarat being a dry, dry state, Nasik is just 150 kilometers from there, which gives them a fantastic landscape setting and alcohol. So this is the panorama house with, uh, this is one of the images clicked from the site uh, on one of the very first or second visit, I think. So uh, this is the Gangapur Dam backwaters and me and Munali go on drive till here regularly with our coffee. Uh, as we cannot afford to build a house, we at least enjoy the visuals. So uh, the idea here was that the setting is so interesting already uh, that you have a backwater in front and then you have mountains at the back of the house that the concept was to just respond to this setting with uh, the minimum possible and then this is the context section which shows how the house is placed and if you see this both these and these are equally important so what we did as a response was to just create this uh, deep frame or a deep box, almost like a binacular, and you could just occupy that space, uh, which is wrapped with verandas uh, on either side. And whatever you see mm, is a great visual uh, beyond this point. So there are these eight feet of verandas on either side, which protects you from the direct heat and uh, rains. And then the 16 feet inside is the house uh, without any clear uh, segregation. So if you if you sort of so this is how the house sits uh, on these mounds, which are artificially created out of the excavations, which we had done for the swimming pool and few other things. We created this uh, landscape where you climb up. So the site has some subtle slope of four to five feet and we've added this mound. So you sort of subtly climb and you enter on the first floor and the lower level is almost hidden. So the lower level is a 16 feet wide building. And the upper level is 32 feet. So it just, just cantilevers on all four sides, creating this floating frame, which is all done in pigmented, brown pigmented concrete, matching to the color of the soil. So the idea was to create this very subtle sort of box uh, without any paint, plaster, no flooring, no false ceiling. So the RCC slab is directly polished to get this. And then these two solid boxes, which kind of become these two pilasters to support uh, the building, are the toilets and ducts to take in all the services. Uh, the bedrooms are on the either side and this is the uh, living dining with one small uh, serving counter and the kitchen is below this. And there is another third bedroom here with a small lounge. So everything of these glass sliding windows can be gathered at these two bo black boxes and the entire house, instead of a bedroom and a living, becomes one large gathering space, which is over a period become a favorite uh, party space. So this is not something which we had very clearly thought as architects, but people have found their own ways of occupying uh, these spaces. So this is how the living sort of opens. Uh, what you see in black is these mesian plus columns with a gap in it. We just took that idea of those columns and took it ahead where there were four angles with this gap where you can almost see the sky through the column. Uh, and it just kind of is like a loop, which is open on the either side. And what you see here is the swimming pool again made with black granite, almost like a pool, which is carved in the ground. And you can see that the RCC slab, which is a pigmented concrete slab, which is directly polished. So here, the idea was to just, all of us have drawn these mountains and the water and the boat with the sun setting behind these mountains. So when we went to the site, it had this great setting. We had gone around 4 or 5 p.m. and we were there till the evening. So as architects, our idea was to just capture this uh, setting and relive that moment. Uh, this is uh, from the fame game uh, recently uh, showing the panorama house. And then this is how Nasik is trying to project uh, these images uh, as these uh, aspirational houses coming up. Uh, this is another commercial development uh, in the, the new Nasik, very much on the college road. 
uh, very close to those rest of the images which I showed you guys in the initial part of the presentation. So we call it the tower with multiple grounds. So this is the uh, context. So the main spine which you see is College Road, uh, where you have uh, this as one of the very old, almost more than 100 year old educational institution. Uh, you have all of these commercial uh, establishments, which are now slowly going deeper in these residential zones, which are all these old buildings are now slowly ripped off and there are commercial developments coming up. And then we are based here. So all of this development is kind of a mid-rise uh, development with buildings ranging from 15 to 18, 20 meter height. Uh, but with the new bylaws uh, coming in, uh, the unified bylaws and also before that, uh, now we are allowed to build more than 100 meter in Nasik. And then this was one of the first buildings to go vertical in this uh, context. So the project actually was a typical um, shopping come office building. And while interacting with me, the client said that they are looking at also doing their office somewhere close by in a land parcel which would be 500 600 meter and then while working on the project uh, i thought that uh, if you make it uh, like a 500 600 meter office somewhere on the ground with these taller buildings surrounding you it won't be a great uh, feeling uh, what if i give you uh, a head office on top of this with exactly that size of plot like a 600 square meter plot and uh, so based on that idea, we created this. Uh, and what is happening with these new bylaws that you're allowed to build really huge footprints with minimal margins, which is completely taking away the ground. Uh, so to just negotiate this idea, what we thought that, okay, if it is taking away the ground, what is the closest level from the ground where we can give this back? Uh, so we thought that, and we started negotiating or discussing with the clients and they were like ground floor we cannot give because we sell it at 15,000 rupees a square feet. Other everything else is sold at 8,000 rupees from first floor. So we said, okay, after the ground, can you give us this terrace and we can just squeeze the building and go upwards. What this does was two things that it very well responds to the, this diagram will explain it better it kind of increases your distance from the immediate building and gives you a lot of buffer. You have already very well responded to the ground. So the uh, shops are at the ground, you have squeezed your building and then you go upwards by creating this extra buffer. And then you establish another ground once you have crossed all of these buildings. So rest of the buildings are 18, 20 meter. This is the first sort of building which is going around 50 meter in this context. So we've established two terraces, one at nine meter level and another one at 36 meter level. So after 36, the bylaws say that you need to squeeze the building uh, and have a stepped margin. So what we've done is that the stepped margin, whatever we were getting is practiced, is uh, developed from top to bottom and the plate just floats. Which So in this sort of race of verticality, we were also talking about a certain sense of horizontality. And then from this height in Nasik, you precisely get a very similar panoramic view, which you get from the panorama house. So the idea was to uh, talk about spatiality in this uh, very uh, sort of stressed kind of commercial uh, development also. So then this is one of the uh, collages which we had developed. So this is one of the drone image uh, from the location. And what you can see is these surrounding uh, mountains. And then uh, this is what you would see from that height. So these are some of the models made for the project where you have this shopping here, and then you have this space. So what we have been also doing as architects is that we try and uh, suggest certain programs to our clients as part of the project where we had suggested them that it would be great if you could open this up for a restaurant or a certain development like that, like a food court or a restaurant where people could climb up and occupy this and enjoy a certain street character, if not possible on the street level, at least on a certain level after that. 
and then this becomes the corporate office of the developer himself where this is where the entire team and the staff sits and this is where they sit uh, enjoying this extended uh, ground beyond their office spaces and then other than of course the concept and the form the finer details were that we were trying to uh, do this first kind of commercial building in nasik with sliding windows and mosquito mesh instead of uh, a glazed facade uh, or a structural glazing because nasik has a fantastic climate and at least 9 to 10 months of the year you can work without air condition so the idea was to give this flexibility uh, to individual users uh, depending on their personal comfort to have uh, natural ventilation and only use air conditions as and when required by not compromising on the vocabulary or the look and feel of the building so this is uh, one of the uh, execution images and you can see that how it responds to the immediate building instead of uh, building up the entire allowable footprint at a time and creating these narrow marginal spaces we just squeezed our built form and only expanded it after a certain height this is one of these scaffolding is done to wrap up the whole building so instead of painting it because nasik is very dusty so instead of painting we just cladding it with uh, a sintered stone uh, once the building is done no one needs to maintain it later and it just makes it very robust and rough and tough so this would show that how it uh, sort of has this clear view of all the surrounding mountains this is of course at a time when it was little cloudy uh, this is the um, another project uh, in the outskirts of nasik in devlali uh, so this is um, for a client who's based in london and one day i got a call from london saying that uh, we need to make a house in nasik and i thought that this was a great opportunity to earn <laughs> in pounds but then soon uh, while interacting we realized that the client has a very limited uh, budget and uh, wants us to do a house for him which could become his uh, like a holiday home come a house which he might occupy few years later once he plans to retire and come back to india so this was very unique because he is not from nasik he is from gujarat his parents stay in baroda and when he decided to do a holiday home in india he chose nasik so based on the climate uh, and a very sort of green uh, environment so he uh, chose devlali which is one of the military cantonments and uh, uh, very famous uh, as a weekend holiday place so uh, while uh, we were doing this uh, and when he told me that he is on a very tighter budget and we were almost uh, not planning to do the house i had asked him to send us uh, his requirements with the list of people who would use the house and if they have any medical conditions or anything else so while uh, sending the mail in the mail he had mentioned that his sister who stays in the us uh, with her family would also be one of the users who is uh, handicapped below her waist uh, due to some accident and she does not travel frequently to india because uh, india is not equipped uh, with facilities for uh, differently abled and uh, most of the public buildings uh, terribly fail to do this so uh, just as a process while uh, going through all of that we realized that this is kind of a very interesting opportunity to respond architecturally for this issue and then um, we agreed to do a 3000 more than 3000 square feet house in 50 lakhs actually 40 lakhs and then we exceeded by 10 lakhs which he accommodated very well so uh, this is the diagram for the house so it's basically a 20 19 meter by 19 meter plot on which after all the margins what we get is 14 meter by 14 meter of footprint um, and we've made a g plus 1 house and then to make it handicap friendly uh, the most important thing was to achieve that length of the ramp and how do you achieve it and then while doing different exercises and diagrams we realized that 
for us to have maximum length that the ramp will have to be the outermost layer of the house so the periphery of the house becomes this ramp at at one point where the guest bed is uh, we realize that we cannot wrap it around the bedroom because then the privacy would be compromised and then also the courtyard was becoming sort of dead so we just thought that we'll take it around uh, the courtyard so what it does is that you come from the garage you get down with your wheelchair you can come here which is the plinth with an existing gulmohar tree which beautifully shades this entire place and goes on to the terrace and that's why we had to accommodate a terrace here because it almost branches out and covers the terrace um this is the living with the first ramp going to the dining and the kitchen the second one going to the reading space and the library the third one going to a foyer and a veranda for the guest bed and the fourth actually going till the terrace where she could actually go up till the terrace and do some gardening so the idea was to create this all accessible levels where her bedroom primarily is next to the living so that she is not forced to always use this but this is always there as an option so these are some of the images of the model so where looking at the tighter budget uh, the idea was to uh, have rcc uh, like load bearing walls and rcc slab only till the required accessible levels wherever we need a flat accessible slab and everything about that plinths or those levels was lightweight uh, galvalume sheets with fabrication cage uh, and uh, glass wool inside which is a common method uh, used in nasik for making industries or industrial shades so you can very clearly see on the form and how the form is developed and then there are different kinds of pitch roof which come together to create this shell so these are some of the process images this is the first ramp going from the living to the dining space this is from the dining and the kitchen space to the reading area and as the house was going to be uh little uh, rarely used and uh, only at certain point of time and also to cut down on budget the external walls are just slits for ventilation most of the light comes in from the central atrium and the skylight this is the third ramp and you can just see that how the ramps are almost the same flooring and the same space almost just folded like an origami uh, surface this is one of the images from the back side where you can clearly see that how the structural system changes the moment you establish this ground planes at the upper level these are some of the finished images so this is the entrance foyer and as it's already a gated colony the idea was to almost kind of avoid having any compound wall and have very short sort of fencing which could merge with the landscape so the landscape is of course going to be developed further because we were out of budget so uh, we are going to do it in some time once he has uh, money to do that and then these become those smaller slit windows with mosquito mosquito mesh here and simple ply with laminate and this is how the ramps work these are the kind of spaces which are formed with these smaller jaroka kind of seatings coming out in the atriums and this central space becomes one common volume which uh, very well connects uh, everyone throughout the house so this is something which we practice in most of our houses because we feel that the primary thing in a house or a bungalow is this common volume which allows you to interact uh, seamlessly in comparison to an apartment or something which is just done as different levels um this is the uh, last project sorry i have exceeded time uh, so um, i'll just finish this quickly uh, this is called the house at a node uh, which is basically for uh, uh, 
farmer, uh, 150 kilometers from Nasik in Jalgaon, basically. So uh, he approached us uh, and uh, with a very humble uh, budget of 20 lakhs uh, to do the house, which is around 1300 square feet, architecture, interior, everything. And then looking at uh, the budget and rest of the conditions, we offered him to uh, do it for free. The only condition we had was that he had to listen to us uh, and uh, uh, let us contribute. So when I went first time to the site, I realized that uh, the village uh, was already being uh, added with these lot of upcoming RCC uh, houses. So what happens is, uh, this is an illustration which very well explains that, that most of these farmers, when they uh, come from uh, their villages to the cities to say buy fertilizer or anything or XYZ uh, for farming, uh, they look at these tall RCC buildings of the city and then they feel, so this entire aspiration for a pakka house is uh, developed here and then they feel that this is how the wiser or the rich people live and this image is so strongly embedded in their brain that once they have enough money they first thing they want to do is an rcc house with a flat roof and a certain kind of finishes which is fixed in their brain so same was the case with this person who had approached us and uh, uh, but what we tried to explain him, so the entire process was primarily negotiating, not in terms of economics, but in terms of these aspirations and the value system, which the village already had and how we could very well use that and not get influenced by all of these things. So these are the kind of houses which are coming up and what they're primarily doing is that they are not taking up the structural system from the cities, but also these notion of not having a veranda, not having a common space and just trying to encroach as much as possible. So if you see in this house, his plot is only till here actually on the street and then he is cantilevered out and then cantilever his cupboards and everything and then start encroaching and not have anything uh, which creates shade and the highest temperature here goes up to 45 to 50 degrees somewhere in between. So it's almost impossible to sit in these houses at that point of time. And most of these people uh, go to their, so people who have built these new houses instead of the uh, uh, mud walls and the tile roof or um, the mud roof houses, the uh, people who have built these new houses go back to their farms and spend their afternoons under trees in the farms uh, after making these houses, which almost become like these ovens in the afternoon. So uh, this village uh, has a very interesting story. This was next to the river and uh, somewhere in the 50s, the river was flooded and the entire village was sort of devastated. After which uh, the government had planned a new village for them at a certain distance with a grid iron pattern and sort of six lanes vertical, six lanes horizontal. And we are dealing with one of the houses at the corner of this lane with an existing tree. So this was their existing house, which was more than 50, 60 year old and uh, uh, in a very bad condition, the roof, uh, which is a mud roof with the wooden members uh, was all in bad shape. The wood was already, uh, you know, very uh, bad in condition and it was leaking so they wanted to do a new house and then we proposed to retain the tree and use it as a interesting reference and to also uh, to establish a certain sense of scale so this was a family house which was continuous and they owned only till here so this was supposed to be sort of split and ripped off and then built and then this eight feet is their brother's house who's also built it simultaneously while we were doing after we did uh, as an rcc house and we uh, chose to do something different so this is how uh, we responded to the street to the idea of plin which could be occupied by people on the streets and then this is uh, his brother's house which he's done which is just i think eight feet wide 
So the question was that they wanted a G plus one house instead of a ground structure because they wanted two bedrooms, one for themselves, one for their parents, a study space for kids, a living, a formal dining and kitchens area and few other store areas for their farming activities. With such humble budget, what we thought was uh, to create a structure which could be, so I'll just explain it in the images further. Uh, so the idea was to work with very basic RCC frame, exposed brick with rat trap bond, where we could make uh, 230 walls with 75 mm cavity in between, and also save 25% of bricks in this process. Uh, double layered mangrove tiles with uh, uh, roof tiles below, like ceiling tiles below, and mangrove tiles on top of that, which again has a cavity of around 35 to 40 mm, which sort of makes the entire house as a cavity house. This is how it responds. Um, so this is the outer plane. We go in, this is the living space. And all the furniture is primarily inbuilt because we realize that the amount of tile or the flooring which is wasted under a bed or a sofa, you can use half of that tile to create those furnitures. So we used Kota to create these sofas, beds, side tables, wardrobes, everything was created out of that. And then the older pieces of wood which we got from uh, the older house were used to make doors, windows, uh, railings, uh, uh, drawers, shutters for the wardrobes and few other uh, use elements. So this is one of the detailed sections which very well explains that how the flooring folds to create these box seatings uh, which are then painted white from inside with just a cement go tie and with a one ply kept on top of it. And then you can have cushions on top of it. So this is the section from the living, which very well connects you to the uh, street by restricting the size of the opening. Because looking at the climate, the idea was to not let it heat too much. Of course, the house very well gets opened on the north and west, uh, and the south is shared by another house to protect it. And we had used metal members instead of wood for the roofing. So this plinth becomes a very active social space with this extended shade. Very similar to the older house, skipping the character very similar, but actually making it closer to the street. So it was higher before. And now this is so close that anyone and everyone can very easily come and occupy these spaces. Uh, this is the living space and the opposite side is a TV unit with an inbuilt seating. So the railing, the door windows, what you see is from the older wood. And we've painted it only with lime, so just lime, which also allows it to breathe instead of a plastic paint. So it's a very interesting story. Another house which we had done in Pune in 2012-13, we had bought these Tom Dixon lamps, which were costing one lakh rupee each that time. And by the time we did this house, uh, this you now get in two or three thousand rupees. So I have gifted him these four lamps, uh, which costed me I think six or seven thousand. So it's very interesting that how uh, spatially we could almost make it very close to that house which. Uh, costed four crores, and this house entirely what you see is at 20 lakhs. So, this is that uh, extended space on the upper level, uh, which has a seating window which the kids occupy instead of a formal study table, which I have made. Uh, but they prefer to use this more than that study table, which is exactly on the other end of the same space. And the diagram is such that any level you sit, instead also on the terrace. You can still be connected with this sliding window here. You can still be connected with the street and the entrance. So this is the owner of the house sitting with uh, one of the Molvies uh, from uh, the neighboring house. And then this is the extended utility and the Mori and everything. Uh, so yeah, coming uh, to the end, uh, so uh, this is uh, a slide which broadly talks about all the parameters uh, which we've uh, 
sort of realize we have been consistently working with uh, in last uh, so many years. So in last 10 years, uh, when we, as a very conscious exercise, when we started doing this this year, uh, we, re we realized that uh, these were some very consistent parameters coming in different projects. So all of these parameters are common in most of the projects, but the entry point in the project kind of differs in some of the other cases. So for example, for Viveda wellness retreat, materiality became a very important uh, parameter and regional setting. And then how uh, regional practices and craft practices become a parameter. For the office, partiality becomes a very important uh, parameter. Uh, for the panorama house, the idea of context or landscape as a context becomes a very important uh, parameter. And then for the last two houses, how users uh, have become very important. For example, the ramp house, the physical condition of the user became the uh, core concept of the house and to respond to that condition was uh, the primary idea. For the village house, of course, the way of living of the farmers uh, became very important and the economic uh, limitations. So of course, while making it cheaper or while making it low cost or cost effective, the idea was to not make it very fragile, uh, like an urban or so while doing all of this, we also had to respond to one fact that they are farmers and they are going to have this. So they needed a very robust or a rough and tough kind of a house while doing this. So yeah, these are uh, some of the uh, very consistent uh, parameters. I'll just read out the list uh, quickly. So in materiality, one material at a time, this idea of homogeneous material is very important to us. Second is material and region. And then while we are working in different regions, uh, how we can engage with these uh, materials available in different regions, uh, economy of materials and how it is embedded in uh, that region. And then craft. So basically uh, how uh, the details or the craft uh, is developed in a certain region. And then also how different craft practices or uh, different. Uh, so this is the image of one of the projects which we had done in Pune. That's where we started our practice. So where we came across a very specific way of making uh, structure by a sculptor. And then that completely influenced or changed the way of uh, doing a project. And then last one is material as color. So in so many years, the worst uh, or the nightmare for me is to go and select a laminate or a shade because for so many years we have been referring color as material. So if I want something red, uh, we would go for brick. If I want something black or gray, we would go for stone. If we want something yellow, we would go for wood. Uh, so this graininess of the wood, uh, uh, the texture of the brick, the roughness of the stone. So all of these have become very strong references and that's why color for us comes through these materials. In terms of spatiality, we have been very closely uh, trying to understand these different typologies in history and referring to these spatial tropes consistently while doing different projects, right from the caves to the verandas to the steps and platforms, which I showed in the guards, to the nodes, um, courtyards, deep thresholds. Next, which is contextuality. Uh, so as I already explained, regional setting as context, landscape as context, uh, settlement as context. Uh, in case of Nasik, the way I explained initially, uh, changing economy as context, uh, then politics as context. Uh, so this is one of the competition entries which we had done for the Satara Municipal Council, where the idea was to establish this public plinth in a very important uh, public building. And uh, this semicircular portion, which you see, is basically uh, uh, the council hall where all the politicians and bureaucrats will be sitting there. And above that, you have this public garden with a restaurant and a cafe where a common person can come and use it, which is like a symbolic representation of how the common people are above all of this. And to create this theater as a building, which is used for 
street theater, nukkad natak, dharnas and protests. And that becomes the main entry of the project where everyone coming has to be answerable to uh, the common people before they get to enter in the building. So this was uh, our competition entry. And then the user oriented, which I've already explained. So thanks, thanks a lot. And sorry for taking a lot of time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ajay. Actually, I think even if it extended the time, it was worth the uh, uh, explorations that you had to present. So thank you so much. Um, so I mean, before I uh, open up, you know, the uh, questions to the audience, uh, just seeing if there are any. Uh, what I what I was thinking, like you know, a couple of remarks and um, questions that also come to my mind. First one is, let's say, I think somewhere subconsciously. Uh, that uh, the architectural language of Nasik that you showed of the medieval town with the stone base and let's say a lighter uh, you know, structure sitting on top of the stone plinth reflects a lot in your projects also, which I just kind of it struck me that probably, you know, it's kind of subconsciously kind of feeds into, into many of your projects also. There's just one quick remark. And then uh, as a question, the first question that comes to my mind is like, you know, if you look at your second um, the row of um, uh, the parameters that you have listed, which is partiality. So I was just thinking, like, in, like how after, let's say, uh, of course, building towards 1980s Vistara exhibition, 86, um, you know, these kind of notions of a certain idea of Indian architecture was kind of also captured in that exhibition. And one could see a lot of such language being used at least building up to that exhibition and since then by many architects it's almost become a common term to kind of you know, think about architecture per se and that has a particular lineage one can see of architects who kind of think uh, through this kind of um, the, the, the tropes of caves the verandas the steps and the notes and courtyards and so on and so forth and i, I think there's probably a clear lineage of architects who kind of follow that um, that way of thinking but what what i think for me, was interesting to note was that you add these is uh, at least two more interesting parameters, so to speak, which nuance that response um, of spatiality in a very interesting way. For instance, the way you bring in, let's say, I think the six categories of material, the six ways of thinking of material, per se. Right. So, for instance, in a in a Korea's plan or a Doshi's plan, one might, one may see references. Uh, and, one, and many critics have also kind of identified that post that moment, uh, the, the kind of architecture that, you know, someone like Korea produced was not one of his best, let's say, moments also, because it kind of became very literal in terms of translating those found uh, historical, let's say, tropes into architectural language. I think what, what, what is interesting in your way of handling those tropes is that you kind of add that layer of material uh, which which is closely engaging with you know who's actually uh, who has the capacity to kind of you know deal with those materiality in, in some sense and who's participating in the economy of those materials and you know in which context are these materials being kind of mobilized um, so I, do you want to reflect a little bit on that how do you think you fit in that kind of a lineage and you expand uh, you're able to expand uh, and, and why probably kind of something like this became important for you so I think uh, this sort of almost came uh, as a default. Uh, I don't know, also because of the kind of schools we come from, where our teachers have been uh, great uh, followers of uh, Doshi and Korea and continuously referring to these things. And we specifically coming from Nasik or these uh, pilgrim cities, most of our academic projects as part of NASA was also documenting these buildings again and again at different times of um, uh, our uh, study. So I think uh, this looking at these as references was very uh, common or very trendy uh, in those times where you would always tell your juniors that uh, if you have joined architecture, have you seen the Godavari Ghat? If you have not, then you have not done anything and things like that. But then I think from here, taking a break, finishing my BR, and then going to Mumbai and working with few architects, I had almost taken a break and I was on a very different trip where um, suddenly 
I had parametricism in my mind and I had a lot of other things and different influences. But then I think what helped was to also travel uh, after practice uh, as me and Monali could not do because so the intention was initially to do masters somewhere uh, uh, in the West and which we could not do. Uh, so what we decided was that we would travel uh, every year very consciously out of whatever fund we earn, we'll put something to travel. And then this sort of exposed me to a lot of things where uh, me going to the Glen Market Masterclass was another very interesting realization where Glen talks about uh, a very interesting aspect of touch the earth lightly. And I had a very tough time dealing with that because when I came back and when I started looking at what we were doing and the kind of architecture which I appreciate of all of these historical buildings and um, so I realized that these buildings have got a, a sense of gravity which are right. and it's all about ground the building is almost about extending the ground and taking it till the roof and if, if you talk about any historical architecture or um, these old towns if you talk about Jaisalmer, Jodhpur if you talk about all of these, basically, if you see it, if you zoom out and if you look at it, it just has this great connection with ground and the idea of shade, uh, which is very important in a climate like ours. And uh, so my travels to Europe or different places and looking at of different architects there and then coming back and traveling to these historical towns or spending a lot of time in Banaras, which is my native. So I keep on going every year. So there was this very different shift and struggle to kind of find a right way of um, doing things. Which And also as we started little young, the idea was to uh, touch everything as closely as possible and almost run through a very academic way of uh, doing things. I think this slowly um, came up as a Default and only after 10 years that we realized that okay, we were referring these things very uh, clearly in a lot of projects. I think I answered it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think I think what's, what's also nice is that uh, you know, like it's, these are emerging as reflections. It's always good to reflect at Correct. a certain moment in your career. I think to kind of see, you know, uh, because I think when you're in the middle of the you know drill. You probably don't kind of pay attention to what exactly is going on. Some, some moments of reflections are important and interesting, I think. And hopefully, this reflection will bring some shift also in, in the way uh, practice moves ahead. The second question that comes to my mind is like, you know, um, you know see, for instance, um, it appears that like if you're if you're an architect in Bombay, um, the you know, the probability of the kind of work that you'll encounter as a practice will be most likely an interior of a restaurant or a house or you know things like that. I mean, it, it's it's probably a very rare condition that if you're starting afresh and then you know you probably kind of um, get a I don't know one of these new high-rise buildings to be kind of you know, entrusted to a young architect or, or an office to kind of do a project of that scale and magnitude. And in some sense, uh, by being in Second City, it appears like the, the scale of the project for a younger office is not really a constraint, right? Do you, do you see an advantage? Uh, in, this is one of my readings as an advantage of being situated in the, in the Second City. And are there any other advantages that you see uh, as, a, as, a, as a practice situated in Second City? And secondly, let's say um, the, all these programs are almost... Um, at one point unheard of for, let's say, a, a more older practice situated in, in the second city context. And how did you, uh, what are the various challenges and you know, uh, opportunities that you see in kind of being established there? As an architect, how do you think, how do you see yourself contributing to this transformation? And uh, connected question is, let's say, uh, how do you think these, partial, this, these parameters that you have chosen become useful in, in, in kind of you know, addressing those, uh, you know, the challenges that are coming new to the city. So, uh, of course, I think uh, being in a second tier city is giving us altogether a different uh, kind of projects which were not possible. And that's why coming back to Nasik from Mumbai, when I decided to uh, start a practice was a very, very clear uh, decision 
considering all of these things because i was already looking at see coming from a family which is already in construction industry we were very look, closely looking at what architects are doing otherwise also not as an architecture student but also as a child in the family architect has always been a hero in our family from last three generation because he's the one who signs your bills and that's when you get your bread and butter so uh, somehow i realize it now that i have been very closely looking at architecture in some or the other way uh, so uh, of course uh, second year city uh, gives you a lot of opportunity to do architecture and we have reached to a point where uh we only take commissions where we get to do architecture interior and landscape all together and we do not do these things in isolation uh, because i can see the amount of work which is coming and we as an office are not capable of doing anything more than 8 to 10 projects i know uh, the kind of work which we like to do but the enquiries are 50 60 a year so i think in that case you get to choose uh, in a very interesting way and uh, secondly also the pace of the city helps you uh, because you are not doing a vertical project or a big project just to establish uh, yourself uh, okay. primarily because anyways everyone is getting to do this project but what the pace of the city helps you in is to reflect continuously and what has helped us the most is this idea of reflection which almost happens on a daily basis because my house and office is together so i do not have to waste even a second in say commuting and all of that so me and monali go on these long office sessions long drives where we keep on discussing all of these things so i think uh, what i feel is that the uh, second year cities are really giving a lot of uh, opportunity not just to us but uh, to a lot of uh, architects who are present and working here uh, also there is another very interesting aspect is that the kind of clientele uh, because if you see in second year cities uh, there is an advantage and also an disadvantage that the uh, awareness level uh, or uh, the exposure level i would say to correct myself is little lesser than a metro city when a metro city client comes he would say that he is doing he is wanting you to do a house and it has to be a moroccan house or it has to be uh, a greek uh, sort of santorini island house with this kind of color this kind of furniture and he comes with a over clear brief which is too rigid to respond actually but with uh, people from these uh, smaller cities with limited exposure there's always a chance to tweak or re define or rebrief uh, him about the project and that's where we engage a lot i think 70 or 80% effort of my practice is to Uh, sort of rebriefing or engaging in reframing the brief or educating the clients in some way and convincing them that how uh, the building also is beyond a facade and how a programmatic revision in your project might bring a very different shift in terms of business in terms of whatever he his primary intention is so we spend a lot of time with even developer clients to sort of explain them based on our research and understanding of the city that why don't you put a restaurant i think this might get in a very different footfall why don't you do this why don't you do that and because i as a user also in the city have been interacting so i know exactly that here there is a need of a restaurant a gymnasium xyz so we try and plug these programs in different projects uh, in a very subtle uh, way also about uh, these parameters the way you said i think uh, this framework i haven't used it very consciously now with the clients they have been internally using it but i think this framework is very well uh, going to help us now to explain things to them very clearly uh, with a clear framework and talk about the difference which it will bring by using our own projects as a repository or a reference to explain them that how things have been done and how it affected uh, certain things in a certain manner uh, i feel for example the panorama house uh, for us uh, it was just a idea to respond to the landscape and that's why we had kept it so simplistic but then it was looked at as a very different minimalistic exercise and in a way very international style uh, in yes. some way uh, which were not 
our intentions primarily. Right. I didn't even have that much of knowledge of all of these things, but it just came in as a very uh, spontaneous response. And now if you look at this Netflix series or all of that, right. and the way people are referring to these houses as these aspirations. Right. So, yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, like, uh, you know, this like, other thing that comes to mind is like, it's interesting to note how you're also bringing, I think, programmatic interventions. Like, it hmm. reminds me of, um, of course, the days were different and the challenges were different. Uh, how Korea would sort of, you know, intervene at the level of the program and say, you know, why should a mall be like this, a typical mall? If you think of the Salt Lake Mall in Kolkata, for instance, right, it kind of becomes a street almost like a street uh, building rather than like a typical air conditioned thing. So I think, uh, and, and let's say uh, thinking through very carefully of who uh, is building and you know, who's, who are your clientele and uh, for whom are you building the house, like the farmer's house, the ramp house, a very interesting examples also because um, it's not necessarily that, you know, architects should only build for let's say uh, the rich clientele and do a good house only if, if there is you know more money and things like that. And these are some of the things that which which are also very close to uh, how you know we at school also think in terms of um, particularly also the kind of drawings that you've done for the projects, situating the project in a larger landscape, a larger context, uh, thinking very closely of you know every decision that goes into making the building has an influence somewhere down the line and impact on, on not only on, on that one particular building but also on a lot of things that surround it. Uh, and I think the Viveda project kind of really kind of brings that quality very nicely. Um, and, and I think um, it's, it's nice to see, you know, offices, even if, let's say, uh, you're not able to, um, uh, sorry, even if you're kind of dealing with uh, a straightforward client architect relationship, you're, you're con always conscious in terms of how you are responding to uh, the architecture per se, you know, and, and, and the setting within which the architecture is located. So it's 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 interesting to see that kind of um, practice that you've developed for yourself. Um, with that, what I'll do, Ajay, is like, I'll see if there are any questions from the audience or if anybody from the faculty would want to um, ask a question or something. At least at the moment, there are no questions in the chat. Neither do I see any other messages. So uh, with that, I think probably I'll uh, relieve you also. It's almost 7.30, so we'll uh, close today's session. Thank you very much for agreeing uh, in this lecture. And I must say it's very strange to talk to you in English. <laughs> but it's okay. <laughs> but it's fine. So we'll uh, continue this over a call after this. After, after this. <laughs> formal that. closure. Yes. And, uh, but anyway, so as a closing remark, um, we'd like to thank everybody who uh, took out their time and attended all the six lectures uh, in this uh, semester. And we'd also like to uh, thank Urban Center Mumbai for supporting uh, the CCT series. Um, and yeah, thanks, thanks, Ajay, once again, and uh, I'll talk to you soon after this this thing. All right. Perfect. Thank you. So thanks, much. thanks, Shreyan, Thank and thanks, uh, C School of Architecture, for giving us this fantastic opportunity. Right. Thanks, thanks, everyone. So uh, our next series will be will kind of you know start again in uh, in the next semester, starting in June, in the monsoon semester. We'll keep you posted um, with. Um, with the updates and do check out, let's say the websites um, for CCT, the kind of completely revamped. Uh, and we'll probably have a soon uh, relaunching of all these websites very soon in the month of April. We'll keep you posted on that as well. Um, so once again, thanks and uh, see you all next semester. Yeah.